So it's been uh, excellent being here at the conversations. So I go to these biblical scholar conferences, and let's just say the conversations are a little bit different than the ones I've been having here. It's just a little bit different. I uh, appreciate uh, being with you who are battling and in there every Sunday. Uh, one of the objectives given to me by my president is seminaries don't serve the church. They serve the academy. I want our seminary to serve the church. And one of the first adjustments I made as dean is I took uh, two faculty meetings per semester, and we, we started to have them at churches. And so we'd have lunch with pastors, have these genuine conversations, and that would inform our discussion on curriculum and accreditation and stuff like that. And it's amazing because the first time we did that, uh, one of the pastors in a church in Northeast Portland, which is uh, hugely gentrified, and this is a community of leaders that felt the calling to serve uh, those of African descent in Portland. And they found that most of their congregants were being priced out. And uh, coming to a struggle between their desire and compassion and calling and who was showing up at the door and uh, kind of discerning that. And one of the pastors, probably a 60 something female, African descent, uh, just without irony asked me, how do you, how do you minister to hipsters? <laughs> she asked me that, like, I don't know, like, I have no idea. Uh, another pastor was just sharing the struggle about a Sunday in the parking lot before the evening service, uh, struggling to have a conversation with a, a man with a, a meth addiction. And that's real pastoral work. And uh, I love the academy, but uh, we went into this field to impact communities of faith. So when I say it's a pleasure to be here, I, I really mean this. This is helping me think through my book. It's helping me think through my vocational call as a biblical studies professor, now a dean. And so it's been great and fun. I added on a little bit of, uh, I just added on the dates of this slide, uh, repatriation to front the entirety of uh, what Ezra Nehemiah does. It's not central, but it's totalizing. It has some effect on everything that you do. And anyone here that knows about an immigration experience, it's such a totalizing thing that happens in your life. And I think this is how we are to read Ezra Nehemiah. The first day we talked about any immigration experience or repatriation is traumatic and has crisis. So we discovered in Ezra Nehemiah that God walks alongside us in the trauma and crisis. Doesn't necessarily solve it in the short term, but God will walk alongside us. And even though repatriation forces new positions of power, we learn that God holds more power than the empire. Today, I want to talk a little bit about identity. Uh, identity in Ezra Nehemiah, who is included, and by definition, who is excluded. So about a year and a half ago, I was on a panel of Ezra Nehemiah commentary writers. So it was myself, uh, Liz Freed, who wrote the one on Ezra and is working one on Nehemiah right now. Uh, the WBC commentary on Ezra Nehemiah is also being rewritten, and that's being rewritten by Deidre Fulton. She's a, a professor at Baylor. Uh, I know it's due at 2024, and so it'll be a little bit of time. Uh, Hugh Williamson was also there who wrote the, the, the original commentary for WBC, and uh, Thomas Bolin, a Catholic scholar, who finished a short one on Ezra Nehemiah. And so I gave my presentation and my argument that repatriation needs to frame your interpretation of Ezra Nehemiah. And a, a pretty well-known scholar asked me a question. Uh, uh, what do you mean by identity? How do you define identity? And I did my old trick. We all have the trick. That's a great question. In my mind, I was thinking, that's a great question. Like, I, I don't know what I mean by it. So I don't remember what I said. Uh, I said something, uh, I'm sure. I, I don't remember. But I began to think about that. What do I mean by identity? And so. Uh, identity, it turns out, has this massive set of literature in the social sciences. And before I begin to talk about that, I want to go through this exercise of self-exegesis. What is your identity? I want you to think through two questions. If you have a pad of paper, you're welcome to write this down. Uh, I want you to think, what is one pivotal moment in your life that contributes to your identity? One pivotal moment. And this is something you probably shouldn't overthink. Your first instinct is probably right. One pivotal moment in your life that contributes to your identity. And what is one pivotal moment from before you were born that contributes to your identity? Often we think about our lives individualistically, like it began when we were born, but 
everyone comes with a narrative way before birth. And so from what you know, what you've heard, for some of you it's very little, for some of you it's a lot, what is a pivotal moment from before you were born that contributes to your identity? With these types of questions, uh, what she came up with right away is, is a good one. Um, in the notice, I'm not asking the most pivotal, but, but one pivotal moment. Identity is kind of a weird thing. And it's defined in different ways. And one way that I like to think of, um, let's see, oh, I think I deleted that. One way I like to think about identity is uh, who you are according to yourself and according to others. And so there's a sociologist named Richard Jenkins, uh, not the actor from Happy Gilmore, but the, uh, the sociologist. And he talks about identity as defined by your perception and other perceptions of you, which means you don't control it. He also defines identity from a, a mix of factors like culture and language and religion and upbringing. And based on that, identity is not a static, immutable essence. Identity is constantly being formed and reformed and renegotiated. Who you are at 16 is someone very different from who you are today. In fact, if I were to ask you individually, if I were to go to your 16-year-old, and you're going to someday end up at the Engel Institute of Preaching, how would that 16-year-old respond? To, and actually, some of you are like, yeah, I could see that. And some of you would be like, no, never, impossible. Identity is based on experience, based on what you do. And for us, we actually think about individualized experience. But I want to push you a little bit more. What about group experience? What about collective group experience before you were born? By identity, you include yourself, align yourself with others, but you exclude yourself with others as well. And just as a little side note today, I hope to talk a little bit about the mixed marriage crisis in Ezra 9 through 10 and Nehemiah 13. And just as a warning, if you're expecting answers that will satisfy you, you're going to be very disappointed today. Uh, you could walk out right now because I'm not going to give them to you. I'm going to share with you some of my reading, kind of an approach to this. But theology is um, difficult. It's challenging. It should be disappointing. It should be mysterious. And um, yeah, there will be no clean answer for that uh, question on, on how we address the mixed marriage crisis. Identity for those in the repatriate community was formed way before um, they came back. In fact, in 2015, they published about 200 of these. So these are these cuneiform clay tablets. There are literally about a million of them that are untranslated. A lot of them are located at the basements of libraries in Europe. Uh, and writing, as you know, began as an economic bureaucratic tool. So the vast majority, 99% of these tablets are really, really boring. And so they're like economic lists, like three goats, two chickens, done, and that's it. And so there are Assyriologists that translate these things. They sit in the basements of libraries. There are other Assyriologists that collect these things. They go on um, black markets and eBay. Uh, there's actually a problem with provenance goods as well. Uh, there are fakes, um, but these were found, these were actually found in the black market, but they were, um, there are about 200 of these, and they're a set of economic administrative documents, and so pretty boring, standard. They're from the period of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, from the late, um, actually the, the early Persian period, and these are called the Al Yehuda tablets which you see, on the, and what that means is city of Judeans, and this is in Babylon. And so essentially at the exile, they took a lot of the Judean exiles and placed them in a certain geographic space. And we now know that the Babylonians did that with different ethnic groups when they exiled them and deported them. They had their own communities within Babylon. And we learn from here that uh, it's kind of hard because it doesn't say anything explicitly ideological. It doesn't talk about Passover or anything like that. But there's a clue because there are names on these lists. 
when you do inventories, you have names. And some of these names have what we seem to think are Semitic roots. Uh, one child born in exile was named Yail, which means it might be associated with some longing to go back up, a longing to return. Uh, that's literally the last word of Chronicles, go back up, meaning to go back up to Jerusalem. Uh, so, and we know that they lived and they received rations. They, um, they settled. They made life in exile. There's a whole other set of tablets about this time called the Marashu tablets. Now, these were published in 2015. The Marashu tablets were published over 100 years ago uh, by Yale. And the Marashu tablets were really interesting because they, um, they talk about a family over three generations that had land lent the land to others, gave them seed, and collected a big part of the harvest. So they're essentially like kind of sharecroppers, and they, they made a pretty decent living. What's really fascinating about the Morashi tablets is this is a Jewish family. This is a family of exiles from, from Judah, and we know this by the names. Morashi, interestingly, is their a Babylonian name, but they had Jewish Semitic names as well with that. You had a question? I, I was wondering what's the context. How big were these tablets? Oh, these are tiny. Yeah, and so uh, if you have like that leathery feel of clay and you have a stylus and you're doing these signs, uh, and if you punch holes in them and bake them, they become very permanent. So what happened is often the unbaked clay, they're very broken today, but they were kind of temporary receipts. And then you'd find that the information collated into these summary documents and that those tended to be baked and they left. From what I hear, uh, if you bake them, they're like hockey pucks. They last forever. I've actually never touched a hockey puck in my life, but this is what people tell me. They, they last. On the West Coast, I, we don't. Hockey, like banjo, is just something we saw on TV and never actually <laughs> witnessed in person. Here it's fun. I've heard it. Um, I once tried to watch it, but I can't see the puck. I can't see it. I don't, I don't know where it is. Uh, this was an incredible find because it gives us an example of life in exile. It also gives us example because we know not everyone came back. Remember Ezra 1, you are now permitted to go back. It doesn't say you must go back. So there is a choice. So imagine our exercise on Monday, you have the opportunity to go back to your home country forever. Who would go back and who would stay? And immediately you're starting to identify yourself based on your attitude towards your homeland. Uh, notice the Marashu family did not return and we know they're economically very wealthy. And so why would you leave all this land? Why not settle? We also know the Marashu family took on as their primary name an Assyrian local name. In uh, the late 1970s, my father uh, took my brother and I, uh, sat us down and had one of his talks with us. He said, Roger and Jimmy, my brother's name, uh, we want, I want you to start using your Korean names. Uh, I don't know anything about that except for that memory. He wanted us to use our Korean names. Well, my brother and I were born in the States, and we said, no, Dad, and then we started watching The Muppet Show, something really American. Like, it was, it was a, I, I have that memory for some reason, but there's something about that. What happened, what was going through my dad's name that he wanted us to take on our native Korean names? Uh, and so identity is already being formed. When I talk about identity uh, that's flexible, not something that stays with you the same throughout your life, but something that's constantly changing, constantly being renegotiated. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the identity of the repatriates from Ezra Nehemiah. One aspect that it's formed is through something called social memory. And before I kind of talk about social memory, I want to emphasize uh, Americans, Westerners, there's a, a sort of fixation with historical accuracy that's part of our own cultural construct, right? Did it happen? Did it really happen? And so I have a colleague. He's of Cherokee descent. He does indigenous theology and uh, grew up in Michigan. And every time during Thanksgiving, local public schools ask him to, to talk about Native American culture, heritage. So he'll go to these schools and he'll say stories, Cherokee stories. And Cherokee stories often involve talking animals. So he'll be with these kids and say something like, there was a coyote, and the coyote said something. And the kids would respond, coyotes don't talk, coyotes don't speak. He'll say the same story on the reservation, and you know how the kids respond. They respond, well, what did the coyote say? 
where do the coyotes, so there's a different mindset. And it's not like reservation, Native American kids don't know that coyotes don't speak. They know the genre of what this, this is a life lesson beyond a pure historical fact. And so with social memory, remember that diasporic people, displaced people, they have some sort of idealized vision of a homeland and they bring that forth. And so social memory is kind of a collection of a social identity and historical memory as you remember. So remember my mother talking about Korea in the 1960s, it might have seeds of historical truth, but it might be much more of a construct of who she is today and her experiences of America. Social memories uh, for Ezra Nehemiah, they're collective and they're rooted in a certain experience. And so if you look at Ezra and Nehemiah, there's this constant exhortation to remember. Remember a past way before you were born. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses 700 years earlier. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Remember how God doesn't show up as explicitly in Ezra and Nehemiah. So you're exhorted to remember who this God is, a God told to you by your previous generations. And in opposite, in Nehemiah 9, they refused to obey. They were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. So if you remember God and these great acts, the character of God as displayed in the past, that should inform your identity right now. What's really fun about this is most of the exhortations to remember are to the repatriates, so you can live and have the social identity of, the, of this great past event. The very last verb in Ezra Nehemiah, you actually ask God to remember you. Remember me, oh my God, for goodness. So this almost this covenantal thing, you're gonna remember all these great things of God, but for the very last thing before we stand off, we're gonna invoke God Remember me for my God, my, oh my God, for goodness, or for wholeness, um, or for good. In the midst of, uh, so memory of the goodness of God is such a crucial thing, and it fuels this repatriate hope. And so think about the book of Jeremiah, for example. Uh, and actually, think about a lot of the kind of challenging books of the Bible that are sort of depressing. Um, so Jeremiah... So Leslie Allen wrote the Old Testament commentary for Jeremiah, published about 10 years ago, and it took him seven years to write this. And I, um, I taught at Fuller a little bit when I was in grad school, and I remember asking uh, Dr. Allen, like, hey, how's, how's the commentary coming along? And uh, Dr. Allen, he's British, and he, he's probably close to 80 right now, and if you want to be a textual critic, in Britain of his generation, you decide your career at 10 or 11. So at about 11 years old, he decided he wanted to be a classical scholar, started learning Latin, and uh, he wrote really one monograph, and he spent his life writing commentaries. Com and you know, every five or six years, he'd write a commentary. And so I remember a couple things about Jeremiah, like, oh, how's it going? How, how's the commentary coming along? And he said, like, oh, man, this is really depressing. I just... Uh, being with Jeremiah, and he had a very uh, routine writing. I don't, I write in the margins, nights and weekends, things like that. Uh, but he had a very, like 10 to two on this day, mornings on this day. I said, it's just being really depressing, being with this person, living in light of an exile that's coming or an exile that's here. Uh, but you look at Jeremiah 30 through 31, it's a very kind of, it's, it's called like the mini apocalypse. There's a lot of hope towards a future rooted in memory in the midst of this kind of depressing text. Uh, after he was done with Jeremiah, I said, okay, what's next for you, Dr. Allen? He said, I'm, I'm writing a commentary on Lamentations. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> that will help. That will make you feel much better. Parenthetically, uh, the other thing I remember him saying is he, a textual critic that spent his entire life writing commentaries, another thing he said, it's actually quite depressing. You could only know a few books of the Bible really well in your lifetime. That was so humbling for me. You could only know a few books really well in your lifetime. Economic support is another thing. So uh, 
I talked a little bit yesterday about market economy. There was this debate that happened through much of the 20th century, not so much in biblical studies, but in ancient Near Eastern studies about do markets exist? And uh, when most Westerners come towards studying the economies of ancient, ancient Near East, they would not state this explicitly, but they would use words like profit and capital that would just presume that market structures exist. When you go to the Eastern European scholars, they would assume much more of a, a Marxist paradigm for economies. Um, what happened in the early 20th century was the birth of economic anthropology. So basically, uh, there was a guy named Malinowski. He was trained in classical political economy at the time, which was John Stuart Mill, which is all based on Adam Smith. Parenthetically, where does Adam Smith get his material? The wealth of nations is a quote from Isaiah. It's the wealth of nations will go to you. Adam Smith was the son of a preacher. And if you talk about the invisible hand, it, it has kind of this notion of God in there as well. But that became the dominant form of how we are to understand the economy through market exchange. And it was assumed that this was universal. Everybody seeks a profit in all time. And Malinowski, as a trained economist, went to the, the Papua New Guinea area, and he observed people on outrigger canoes would take bananas, go on miles and miles in the ocean to trade with other tribes for bananas. And, uh, they did, and, and he came up with this theory that exchange was much, much more based on reciprocal, relational, socially embedded relationships, duties and obligations that you had. And so what I like to propose, and, and now in the 21st century, generally most scholars think, with a few exceptions, I, I think this way, that the economy is mixed. There's some market stuff, but it's most, mostly socially embedded because we don't have coinage. We don't have trade in the way that uh, we understand today. And with a socially embedded trade, you have to understand that when you do economic transactions, you're doing it with people socially related for you for reasons, for coercion or maintaining a relationship. And so how does this play in other cultures outside of the capitalist sphere? And so um, for a lot of immigrant communities, uh, imagine you come to say the United States and you need an influx of cash to buy a house or to start a business. A reason why a lot of immigrants start businesses is because no one will hire them. And so this is the only way that you can actually make. So how do you get the capital to start a business? And so what happens is these lending circles emerge where you have a group of immigrants and you make an agreement that we will all pay a certain fund per month, $100, $1,000, $500, and we'll take turns receiving that. And so uh, everyone's going to receive at some point a lump sum, and you don't need a credit check. Uh, all you have to do is believe in the people to trust the people in your group. And, it, and so Koreans have this. Koreans have this as they immigrate to the states. It's called ke money. Uh, the Chinese have something as well. Uh, this happens with West African immigrants. It happens with Brazilian immigrants. Just a way to kind of have your own informal lending circle without credit check, but also based on your identity. Like think about it, you're really trusting someone else. If you're immigrating here and you're gonna put up a few hundred dollars per month and trust that you will get this at some time, and in fact, uh, recently this has become legally, so like, are you legally bound by these agreements? This has come in the United States courts, whether you can sue other people. Because you can imagine what happens, happens. Some people will get the money and just take off. Uh, but it's amazing how much you're constrained just by the social relationship. They trusted in you. You want to report back and trust them in return. And so economic support works in Ezra in two ways. You got economic support from the Persians, but you also contributed to that. Is there a question? Yeah, it's interesting what you did. You said the Koreans were coming in, and they're coming in. And it's mm -hmm. obviously not the case that you were fighting in Europe. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In the time, like, I don't think this, like, it ha immigration is so different now. Uh, you have to prove a certain fund if you want to be a student. Uh, but another generation of Korean immigrants, you know, they just didn't have anything. They didn't, and they, they needed to find work, and they needed to find jobs. And so 
It's a matter of trust, but there was no other way. There was no other way to survive in, in a lot of these communities. But they still do exist today um, to a degree, these l informal lending circles. Um, so Ezra 7 is the response by the Persian government saying, this is how we're going to economically support you. So this is economic material support, but it's also you're now a part of us. This is also constructing a memory that excludes the ones that stayed because they don't have a relationship with the Persians as direct. So royal and regional gold and silver free will offerings. Verse 17 talks about meat, grain, and drink. Vessels, which are made of often precious metals. Ceremonial, for Tor worship, 100 talents of silver plus wheat, wine, oil, and salt. Remember, uh, I told you one shekel of silver, about 7.8 to 9.4 grams, is one month of labor. A talent is about 32 kilos. So uh, this is probably hyperbole, but it's just saying a ton of silver. You know, that's the, the rough translation of that. Uh, freedom from taxes for the temple servants as well. Um, this is a tremendous gift. And what's, this begins by, this is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to the priest Ezra. So even fronting the letter, it's saying, we, the Persians represented by the king, we are with you in this temple. Meaning we're including you, but excluding those that weren't on this exile journey. The economic support becomes a notion of identity. The building of a wall. So this is Jerusalem, uh, modern day. And I mentioned a little bit about the valley. Part of the reason why I was settled because of the natural fortifications. What you see right in the front is a little bit of the Kidron Valley. If you were to walk in Jerusalem today, uh, it is 10 meters higher than it used to be in antiquity because of all the landfill. It just rises more and more. If you look towards the left, you see um, the, the Hinnom Valley. And so both those two are filled during the time of settlement. During the time of David, there was actually a central valley that would be on the opposite side in the 19th century when Europeans got like, oh, let's go to, back to the land and explore things. They found this nub projecting off the Western Wall. And uh, eventually, they actually found the base to that. And so this is one of the, the many bridges to um, connect the city over the valley, uh, over the central valley. And by the time uh, what happened in the late 8th century, Samaria was overrun. And all these refugees suddenly came down to Jerusalem, and population increased way beyond. Natural childbirth is like a less than 1% increase in population. And so they had to expand the city. That valley was filled. And so by the time of Jesus, it was um, you, you don't see any trace. And that's why you see no trace of that city as well. And so remember, in Ezra and Nehemiah, Jerusalem was very poor. Uh, we know this because there's very little evidence for intense trade. There are very, there's very little luxury goods in there. There's very little housing. And so a wall is made for protection. But in this case, there's nothing really to protect. And so the wall is figurative and symbolic and theological. The wall keeps people inside. Uh, it identifies who you are, but it also keeps people outside. It has to do with notions of purity. And so the wall in Nehemiah 1, uh, it was a symbol of the sins of the ancestors. Because of the sins and their unfaithfulness, this wall is destroyed and taken down and it was breached. But just as the wall, the broken wall was a symbolism for sin, the reconstructed wall was a symbolism for the faithfulness of God, for God's provision for, and that's why the Judeans didn't want anyone else working with the wall. And that's why the Samaritans were so intent on not letting the wall be constructed. The repair of the wall was part of the act of identity. We're creating a boundary between us, us and others. Other ways to develop identity, uh, Torah, language, lists. So identity is created through social memory. When you write this down in a narrative like Exodus, that social memory becomes fossilized. It freezes in time, and it's now protected. And so uh, we all know telephone. We all know how stories change over time and transmission. Uh, this happens in scribal circles as well. If you're looking at an ancient, like a Dead Sea Scroll, the sound for a Y um, and the sound for an I looks exactly the same. The Vav and the Yod look exactly the same in a Dead Sea Scroll. So writing doesn't protect it perfectly, 
but it fossilizes a, a lot more than it would orally. So when you have a written story, that story can perpetuate itself much more effectively than if it was transmitted orally. Language is another thing. Uh, I wrote this article that I showed yesterday on code switching uh, until the 1970s when people would go from language to language. The, the assumption was you're going to the easier language. You're, you're going to a language that you feel more fluent depending on the circumstances. And uh, the studies of code switching began in a Norwegian fishing village of bilingual villagers where people began to realize you code switch, you would have code switching with people that are perfectly fluent in two languages. So when you choose a language, you're choosing an expression of identity because you all know in every language there are certain things that you just cannot translate. And to put across that meaning, you'll use the original language, the, the language of th that native conversation. So code switching is a really interesting thing because, as I mentioned, the fluency between Hebrew and Aramaic shows a degree of power. But even more than that, it shows identity. We know the language of empire is Aramaic. And we are good at Aramaic. We know imperial Aramaic. We know our regional Aramaic. We know our colloquial Aramaic. But most of Ezra Nehemiah is written in Hebrew. This is our language. And Hebrew uh, later, you, you know, one of the ways you translate it is literally in Hebrew, the holy tongue. It's Judean, it's Hebrew and modern Hebrew, but it's also called the holy tongue. Something about this language that represents and has our identity. And there's nothing more exclusive than four people teaching, speaking a language with one person that doesn't understand that language. That is a community marker. There's also a feeling of, uh, there's a feeling that evokes when people that are socially displaced are able to speak their native language. And so uh, there was an announcement about something funded by Lily. Lily has changed my life. Lily has been so influential on the seminary, and I just got back two weeks ago from a pastoral retreat where we're, happy, we're hoping for pastors to thrive. Uh, Lily wants us to help them thrive and not worry about the congregations. And one of the things we learned is people with community, and also the second thing, people, pastors that regularly engage in spiritual disciplines tend to thrive, at least self, like by reading the Bible, by pray, acts of prayer, whatever your spiritual discipline might be. And so at the very end, we had um, a time of prayer for um, different pastors, and the director of the institute just encouraged people to play, pray, and she used the words heart language, your heart language. And there was prayer, and um, at the end, one of the pastors, his spouse, is going through a, a severe medical challenge. And we prayed, and one person, this pastor is Latino, and another Latino began to pray in Spanish. And then another pastor began to pray in Korean. And it, it was such, and of course, a lot of us are excluded from the prayer, but in conversation, that was the most sacred moment of four days, this, this prayer time in a language that really meant something in your communi communication for God. Language, it's not just a matter of fluency, but a matter of expression of identity. One other thing, the list, Ezra Nehemiah is obsessed with lists. So it begins with Ezra 2, these are attorneys. Then Nehemiah 7, these are the returnees. Who gave what to the temple? This is a hard thing to communicate to people in the West, how important this is. So this is one image that might show you something that looks very mundane on the outside. You put this in context, and it's extraordinarily meaningful. And so lists, census lists, can also pass through oral tradition. And you could think about the importance of generations saying, I'm identified with this name amongst this entire chapter of 72 verses, uh, which is meaningful and, and brings an emotive experience and a reaction. It identifies you, we are included, we are indeed part of this group. The creation of identity is, um, you know, when you talk to a lot of people that think about Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, you think about building plans, capital plan, you think about leadership. And if you were to ask me, I actually think identity would be one of the key terms, the key ideas. You have to front it with trauma and power because that's part of identity. But identity is really one of the most strongest themes that emerged from Ezra and Nehemiah. 
And it does through um, defining who you are, defining your experience. And this is really important to use the metaphor of family to do so. And what you see here, uh, the right is um, on the outside. This is what's called a four-room house in the city of Megiddo. And some of you might have been there, this incredible archaeological site. And on the left is a reconstruction. So for a long time, this was understand to be a very specific Israelite identity ethnic marker that you would have these types of homes. Since then, these homes have been discovered on the Transjordan, other parts, but still there are arguments by archeologists, this is an identity marker of people that we're gonna form homes that are kind of egalitarian, right? It's egalitarian. So in that house, I don't know your living arrangement, but I just want to imagine this house. And so um, if you're in Israel, you're going to live in your father's family if you're male or your husband's father's family if you're female. And this is true for many cultures. And so if you're female, you leave your household to go to your husband's family. The patriarch would be the oldest living male, so the father, and when the father passes, it goes to the, the next um, oldest son. And... Uh, Women were pregnant constantly. Uh, in antiquity, they knew that breastfeeding was a natural form of birth control uh, that would take effect for about 18 months. You typically breastfed, as, as far as we know, for about three years. And because of childbirth, because of the difficulty of raising children, because of famine, because of disease, the lack of medical attention, if you uh, had two sons at the end of fertility, you're actually doing pretty good. Add on to that conscription for war. And so if you can imagine, you have four rooms. One room is for the patriarch, uh, father-in-law or father and mother-in-law. One room is for one son and wife and kids if you have them. And another room is for another son and wife and kids if you have them. And the other room is often for livestock. And so you remember that Jerusalem sits high. It actually snows in Jerusalem about every other year. Um, it, it can get cold. And so livestock smells terrible, but it, it provides some warmth actually within that room. And this is not a big room. So just kind of imagine what this does in terms of identity for the family. What happened in uh, ancient times is um, because of any social displacement, it disrupts family. And so when you look at the Bible, uh, you see words like a tribe, you see words like extended family. Those words are actually very rare in Ezra and Nehemiah. So with a social displacement, it disrupts the family. A big family with grandparents and cousins, that's disruptive, and there's a move to a nuclear family. And this is reflected in the archaeological record to some degree. One example is cooking pots get smaller because you're not cooking for 12, you're cooking for six instead. Because there's disruption, you're scattered. So what happens in Ezra and Nehemiah you lose the words of tribe, you lose the, lose the word of extended family, so Shevet and Mishpahat, but you do see words like um, father, brother, kin, daughter. The nuclear family emerges, and now your community takes on a fictive kinship. So it talks about people outside your family, but if you came back in the exilic return, if you came back in the repatriation, you now have a fictive kinship with one another. It forms, and it's based on the exile experience and this return. You see um, uh, the word, instead of tribe, you see house of the fathers. So your connection is not lineage through your greater tribe. The connection is through ancestry that you share, ancestry that have this longer narrative. Family is no longer bound by spatial dimensions. Family is bound by that wall and by observance to Torah and a shared story codified in Torah, by observance and different Sabbath arrangements. Um, I want to talk about, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, Ezra 9.10 and Nehemiah 13, the idea of family. Uh, but before, before that, I want to reiterate uh, to ask you, and in fact, I probably will talk about this more tomorrow, um, but just kind of give you a little bit to ask you to suspend your judgment on this. Think about being a community that's socially displaced, returning to the land with this calling that you need to maintain your identity as a Judean as you return to this land. 
think about a community that it's actually easier to speak Aramaic than Hebrew. Speaking Hebrew is a fight, and your children don't speak Hebrew. I want you to imagine that you come back with joyful expectation, but you see a devastated city. Remember that the grandparents said, this is a glorious time, but Cyrus is now king, or Artaxerxes, or some Persian, and the temple is nothing, and the walls are battered. And how do you maintain identity and to give the generosity of interpretation? In asking you to do that as well, I want you to fully give your attention to the moral responsibility in interpreting this text. What you read should, to a degree, be horrific. And a proper, mature theological reading will also take into the account the other. What would it be like to be a foreign woman or a foreign child within this reading? And what I want to do, I haven't given enough time for conversation with you, so I just want to read this together as a community, and then tomorrow we'll kind of unpack this a little bit more and think how are we, and, and I'll give you some ideas of what scholars have proposed to kind of help us think more about uh, this crisis native to its time. Towards the end of Ezra, after everything is all done, after they celebrate the Passover, uh, then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have trespassed and married foreign women, and so increased the guilt of Israel. Now make confession to the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, it is so, we must do as you have said. But the people are many, and it is a time of heavy rain. We cannot stand in the open, nor is this a task for one day or for two, for many of us have transgressed in this matter. Let our officials represent the whole assembly, and let all in our towns who have taken foreign wives come at appointed times, and with them the elders and judges of every town, until the fierce wrath of our God on this account is averted from us. Only Jonathan of Asahel and Jaziel, son of Tikva, oppose this. And Meshulam and Shabbatai, the Levites, supported them. The last verse. Why do they include that? 